Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another live stream Vision Valley podcast. Today, I'm joined by Professor Jody Magnus. And today, we're going to be talking about her book, The Archaeology of Qumran and Badezi Scrolls. And I have a link to purchase her book in the description below. There are two, there are two editions, the first and second edition. I have the link to the second edition. So you can go ahead and pick that up if you want. I highly recommend that you do. Now, that being said, uh, welcome back to History Valley, Professor Magnus. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Yeah. Thank you. So let's get started. Um, can you tell us a bit about the exploration of Qumran and the Dead Sea prior to the discovery of the scrolls? Oh, well, actually, yeah, the area of the Dead Sea had been explored quite extensively by um, uh, Western explorers uh, from the US and, and Europe, Western Europe in the 19th and first half of the 20th centuries. Um, this was part of a larger interest in uh, in documenting sites that are connected with the Bible. Um, and so uh, the site of Qumran had been noticed. Uh, people had walked around, um, looked at the ruins. Um, there was even a teeny little bit of excavation there before the middle of the 20th century. Uh, but but because the ruins are small and unimpressive looking, they, they really did not attract um, much attention from um, explorers and archeologists until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the caves near Qumran. And that was when um, archeologists began to look more closely at the site of Qumran. How many scroll fragments were found before the major famous discovery had taken place? Well, the, the first discovery, the initial discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls occurred in the winter spring of 1946-1947 when, uh, when Bedouins, the local nomads, um, wandered into a cave in the vicinity of Qumran, which we now call Cave One, uh, and found a row of, reportedly, found a row of tall cylindrical pottery jars covered with bowl-shaped lids and then removed um, scrolls that apparently, at least some of which were in those jars from the cave. And that cave, cave one, yielded altogether seven complete or nearly complete scrolls. So in that case, the scrolls were actually in a pretty good state of preservation and there's there are seven of them that are complete or nearly complete. And those scrolls eventually, there's a long story about what happens with them, but eventually all seven of those scrolls were acquired by the state of Israel and those are the scrolls that uh, visitors see today when they go to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. There's a special building the, called the Shrine of the Book, which houses and displays those seven scrolls from Cave One. But as you correctly say, the majority of the scrolls were found after that initial discovery. And after the, the scrolls were found, how was it determined that the that the sect at Qumran were Essenes? Uh, well, um, okay. So first, let me say that not everyone, not all scholars, agree that they were Essenes. <laughs> I happen to uh, to subscribe to that point of view, um, and I think it's probably fair to say that it's a majority point of view. But I don't even know if I would say it's an overwhelming majority. Um, scholars are quite divided on that. Um, with regard to the site of Qumran as an archaeological site and the connection with the scrolls. So, so there, are, there are several levels of controversy. So one controversy is the connection between the scrolls and the site of Qumran, because the scrolls were not actually found at the site of Qumran. They were found in caves surrounding the site of Qumran. And that is what has made it possible for some scholars to claim that the scrolls found in the caves have nothing to do with the people who lived at Qumran, uh, and therefore, they divorce the scrolls from the site of Qumran, say that the scrolls really don't tell us anything about the people who live there. And scholars who subscribe to those theories then identify Qumran not as uh, the settlement of a Jewish sect or the Essenes or whatever, but um, they interpret it in other ways. For example, as a, a villa, a manor house, a fort, a pottery manufacturing center, a commercial entrepot. Um, so that's that's one level of, of disagreement. And And I will say that uh, although although that debate and those identifications get a lot of, of media attention, um, it's really a, a very easy point of view to refute because uh, the same types of pottery were found in the site of Qumran and in the surrounding caves, uh, which connect the site with the caves, with the scrolls, uh, and not just the same types of pottery, but types of pottery that are distinctive to Qumran that are basically not found at other sites for all intents and purposes. 
And the clay from which the pottery is made has been analyzed and it's the same clay. Uh, so that we have, we actually have an archeological connection between the scrolls and the site of Qumran. Uh, and um, there's also a physical connection because some of the scrolls uh, were found in caves that are located in the Maral Terrace. Maral is a, is a natural formation in the Maral Terrace on which the site of Qumran sits, which means that the only way to access some of the caves with the scrolls would have been to walk through the site. So, so all of those alternative theories that divorce the scrolls from the caves, I think, you know, are pretty easily dismissed. The second thing, though, is that if you do connect, which, again, I think a majority of scholars do, if you do connect the site of Qumran with the scrolls in the caves um, and, and assume that the people who lived at the site were the same people who used those scrolls and deposited them in the caves, then, then you're, you really kind of have to conclude that these people were Jewish, were Jews, who were members of a distinctive Jewish sect with a very distinctive uh, worldview and, and beliefs and practices, um, and and so it becomes then what many of us call a sectarian settlement. I just heard an esteemed colleague give a, a lecture a week ago, um, in which she, you know, she wants to say that that it's not a sectarian. Sectarian isn't the right word to use. I I can understand that, but anyway, I use that word. Um, but then the question becomes, which sect is it, right? Can we identify which sect this is, which ancient Jewish sect? And that's where the the kind of more controversies come in. Because nowhere in the Dead Sea Scrolls is the word Essene ever mentioned, at least not by that name. We learn about Essenes from contemporary authors, men who lived in that period, who write about a Jewish sect called the Essenes, whose beliefs and practices sound quite similar in many cases to what we read about in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And those authors would be, uh, for example, Flavius Josephus, the ancient Jewish historian, and Philo of Alexandria, the Jewish philosopher, and uh, Pliny the Elder, the same Roman Pliny who died when Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79. So, um, so they talk about a group called the Essenes. Pliny even mentions that they live on the shore of the Dead Sea, um, placing them pretty much in the area of Qumran. Uh, and so many scholars, including myself, identify the Jewish sect that lived at Qumran with the Essenes, but it, it takes a series of steps to, to get to that conclusion. And, and as I said, not all scholars uh, agree about that. Do some scholars identify um, the Qumran sect of a different sectarian group aside from the Essenes? Well, um, yes, although, although they don't, okay, so now I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna say when I talk about scholars, I'm gonna talk about mainstream because there's, a lot of controversies about Qumran and you get some, you know, theories that I would consider to be fringe. But if we're looking in the kind of mainstream, um, mainstream scholars who, who do not agree that we have good evidence to identify the um, Qumran sector, convincing evidence that they were Essenes, would probably identify them as members of a Jewish sect. But the question is, which Jewish sect? And, and the problem is, is that our our ancient sources are, are a little bit... Um, sparse about Jewish sects, names of Jewish sects. So uh, the main ones that we hear about from this period are the Pharisees, the Sadducees, then we then we have the Essenes, of course. Um, Jesus's movement would be another example. There are later references and other sources to other Jewish sects, but then trying to identify um, any one of those with the group at Qumran becomes very problematic. So I don't, well, first of all, I will say that I don't know of anybody who, you know, any mainstream scholar who identifies the Qumran sect with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or Jesus's movement, uh, but whether they were members of, you know, one of the sects that we know much less about, if you don't think they were Essenes, then maybe they were one of those other sects, but which one there's, there's really, as far as I know, nobody has a good idea about which one that would be. What is the best evidence or similarities between the Qumran sect and the Essenes that bolsters the view that the Essenes are of a Qumran sect. Right. And and it's interesting, our, our main source of info. So first of all, we have the, the reference in Pliny, which I will say is the shortest and most confused of all of the references in our ancient sources, but but a very valuable piece of information which places the them living geographically in the same area as Qumran. 
Uh, and I should also mention, by the way, that 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 members of this sect were based not only at Qumran, but lived in towns and villages around the country, including in Jerusalem. This was a small sect. It wasn't, you know, like there were huge numbers of them, but they, it, Qumran is not the only place they lived. It's the only place where we can identify the remains in the archaeological record. Right. But um, but anyway, so just to clarify that. Um, but it's Josephus who provides the the longest and most detailed uh, description of the Essenes. He actually claims he's also the only one of our ancient authors who claims to have a personal familiarity with them. He claims that he was a member uh, of the sect at some point during his life. So he gives a lot of very valuable information. And uh, he, you know, he um, mentions some specific points that correspond really closely with, with some details of their lifestyle. For example, the way that they have communal meals. So they work out in the fields, they uh, full members reconvene for their communal meals. They, they immerse themselves ritually in a ritual bath to purify themselves. They put on um, fresh garments and their garments were made of linen. Uh, and um, then they enter the, uh, the dining room, a communal dining room and have a meal, which they have in, which they, which they have in silence pretty much. Um, they, uh, each member is given a portion, a specific portion, the same portion of, of food as everybody else, food and drink. Um, and so there, there are certain aspects of their lifestyle which correspond both to what we read about in terms of their practices in the scrolls uh, and also um, uh, what we see re reflected in the archaeological record at Qumran. Um, aside from that, there are there are other aspects that that kind of jump out. Things like the pooling of possessions, for example, um, a sort of a, an emphasis or dichotomy on light versus dark. Uh, um, they called themselves the sons of light. Everybody else was the sons of darkness. This was an apocalyptic sect that anticipated the imminent arrival of the end of days, or even believed that it was already underway. So, so there are certain things that that these ancient sources, these ancient authors, that 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 they lived an ascetic lifestyle. Um, but there, so there are certain things that these authors mention in terms of both the beliefs and like the everyday life and practices of members of this sect that um, that correspond to. Um, what we read about in sectarian scrolls from Qumran, that is scrolls that were authored by members of this sect and describe their beliefs and practices. And also um, in some cases, I believe with the archeological remains. And how do archeologists date what they dig up? Yeah, you know, this is one of the things that's funny. I cover that in, I have a introductory class to archeology. span And so I always like to explain that um, so if we're digging, like we're let's say we're we're digging in the ground and we find the remains of a house. Uh, how do we date when that house was built, when it was occupied, when it was abandoned or destroyed or whatever? How do we do that? So basically, uh, methods of dating, the types of things that we use to date, fall into one of two categories. Either they uh, are artifacts or objects or whatever that carry their own date, so finds that carry their own date, or they are extremely common finds on archeological excavations. So things that carry their own date, for example, uh, coins, right? Coins have a date on them. Um, and by the way, every, every method of, of dating that, that I'm gonna mention has uh, advantages and disadvantages, right? Advantages and drawbacks. So coins are great because they have dates on them, uh, but um, a lot of times coins, most of which were made of bronze uh, or copper in antiquity, have disintegrated to the point where the date is no longer legible, so you can't date them. Um, coins tended to circulate for long periods after they were minted in antiquity. So if you find a coin lying on a floor of a house, it might have been circulating for a century or more before it got dropped on the floor, and that could skew your date. Um, and coins were valuable in antiquity, and we don't always find coins. And, and then if you're digging a site before coins were invented, because coinage, coinage was only invented somewhere around the year 600 BC. You know, before that, you don't even have coins um, in the area of the Mediterranean and the Near East. So, so coins are great, but you know they have their advantages and disadvantages. That would be an example of a, a kind of a find that carries its own date. Um, another example would be um, uh, radiocarbon dating. Um, radiocarbon dating is where you send uh, organic material that you find to a lab, and you get dates back. Usually what you get is a range of dates. And so somewhere in that range is going to be so. Um, so it's great because you get a lab based date back. But but, you know, there are problems with radiocarbon dating, too, which include that you don't get an exact date. You get a, a date range within a certain degree of probability. 
Uh, and in, in areas like the Middle East, the ancient Near East, where wood was very valuable, if what you find is a piece of charcoal, burnt wood, uh, and you're using that to date, that wood could have already been centuries old and recycled before it ended up getting burned. Uh, that's why seeds are are good because seeds generally don't you know last beyond one or two seasons. But um, but a lot of times what we what we find are pieces of, of charcoal. And of course, another problem with radiocarbon dating is that um, that organic materials are precisely the kind of materials that generally don't survive for thousands of years in the archaeological record. So you know there's that. But but again, radiocarbon dating would be you find uh, you know a or- piece of organic material and you can send it to a lab and then it carries its own date. Inscriptions, even undated inscriptions can be dated based on the style of the handwriting, just like today our styles of handwriting have changed over time. Maybe when you were in school, you had to like read the the uh, Declaration of Independence or something like that. You could see how our handwriting styles have changed and they change like that in antiquity. So even if a, an inscription is undated, um, specialists can date the inscription roughly, at least uh, based on the style of the writing, the style of the script. Um, So all of those would fall into the category of kind of, you know, things that carry their own date. Um, Extremely common artifacts on archaeological excavations. Well, the primary thing in in the periods that we talk about, we're talking about um, in the Mediterranean and Near East would be pottery, right? Pottery was used by everybody. It's found in huge quantities at archaeological sites, every archaeological site. And um, it's a kind of an object that doesn't carry its own date. But if you, you know, you find it in these large quantities, you can try and determine changes in the style, the, the shapes of the pottery over time and in different types of regions um, and arrive at rough dates for, for the pottery. So, um, so pottery can also help you date. And in fact, archaeologists use pottery as a very important means of dating what we dig up. What else do we know about the Qumran sect? Wow, that's a big question. Uh, okay, so um, so uh, the and, and let me before I answer your question say that that you know everything that I'm saying about Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls is uh, debated because Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls are a very controversial topic and there's lots of scholarly disagreements and and some of them are you know more well founded than others but. You know, no matter what I say, somebody is going to disagree with some of it. But I, I do like to think that what I say represents a more or less mainstream view. So qualifying it first. So the Qumran sect was a, and again, I'm using the term sectarian, even though, again, I'm I'm aware that not all scholars even would use that term. But it was a, a Jewish sect that apparently was established sometime around the first half of the second century BC. Um, again, not, not complete agreement on that, but sometime between around 200 to 150 BC, um, by apparently established by a group of dispossessed Zadokite priests. So what the heck is a dispossessed Zadokite priest? So centuries before the time of Qumran, uh, when Solomon built the first temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, he had appointed a man named Zadok, uh, Hebrew Zadok, Z-A-D-O-K, to officiate as the first high priest in that temple. And from that point on, all the high priests who officiated in the Jerusalem temple traced their ancestry back to Zadok, and they became known as the Zadokite line of high priests. In the first half of the second century BC, through a, a, a series of very complicated events, the Zadokites lost control of the Jerusalem priesthood, and other priests who were not Zadokites took over, and the Zadokites became dispossessed. Now, this family at this point, the Zadokite family, was very large and extended and branches off into different directions. One branch of this family apparently was instrumental in founding and at least initially leading this sect, members of which later settled at Qumran. Qumran didn't exist yet at this point. Um, This particular branch of the Zadokite family believed that the current priesthood in the Jerusalem temple, the guys who were not Zadokites, were usurpers who were um, unfit to serve and who had polluted the temple. And that was the, you know, that was like the worst thing that could happen if you were a Jew, because it meant that God would be unhappy and would abandon his people. The point of the, you know, the sacrificial cult in the Jerusalem temple was to keep God there with you to protect you and to do good things for you. So if you, if you alienate him, he's going to abandon you and there's not going to be there to protect you. So they believed that the current priesthood in the Jerusalem temple was impure, unfit to serve, And so they apparently withdrew, refusing to participate in the sacrifices offered in the temple. 
and constituted themselves as a sort of substitute temple, or I think actually more appropriately, a kind of a substitute or temporary wilderness tabernacle, if you wish, uh, and were led by a figure, at least initially, um, perhaps the founder or refounder of the sect, a, a figure who they call the teacher of righteousness. And um, this figure, the teacher of righteousness, is mentioned in a number of the sectarian scrolls from Qumran. Uh, and, uh, and there's a lot of debate over who he was. One of, the, uh, one of the characteristics of many of the sectarian scrolls is that when they mention real people, real historical figures, they refer to them not by their real names, but by nicknames. So you get the teacher of righteousness, the wicked priest, the man of lies, the lion of wrath. One of the games that scholars play is trying to identify these nickname figures with people who we know, real historical figures. Well, if you go online, don't do it, but if you go online and you Google teacher of righteousness, you're going to come across theories identifying him with Jesus or James the Just or John the Baptist or someone in the circle of Jesus. Those theories are, are pretty much certainly wrong because the, the scrolls that refer to these figures were composed before, well before the time of Jesus. So that leaves open the question of who the teacher of righteousness was. There are different theories identifying him with known figures, uh, but whoever he was, he apparently was one of these dispossessed Attic high priests. And we know that because the, the nicknames are not just nicknames, they're puns. Now to understand the pun, you have to understand Hebrew, but I'll try and explain it. So teacher of righteousness in Hebrew is more hatzedek, which if we translated it literally would be teacher of the righteousness. Tzedek is righteousness. Now in Hebrew, as some of your listeners may know, uh, you don't write vowels. You only write the consonants. And, and so sometimes we don't know exactly how a, a word might have been vocalized because, because the vowels weren't written. So Morehat Sedek, teacher of, of righteousness, right? Sedek would be written Z if we translate, you know, transliterated it into English would be ZDK. If you take the name Zadok and in Hebrew, Tzadok, and transliterate it into English, it's ZDK, right? So so uh, teacher of righteousness, righteousness is actually apparently a pun on Zadok, Zadokite. So he apparently was one of these dispossessed Zadokite priests, but you know, which one again, we don't know for sure. Now, um, it, it was not easy to become a member of this sect. And I, I should mention that, um, that, as I said before, members, there were members who lived all around the country um, in towns and villages, including in Jerusalem. Um, it, at least some went to live apart in the desert. Qumran is one such desert community. Whether there were any others, we don't know because we can't identify archaeological remains at any other site associated with this group. But we know that that there were. We have other references to members of this group that lived around the country, members of this sect. Um, and it was not easy to become a member. To become a member, uh, first of all, um, membership was was not open to everybody. Membership was actually full membership was open only to a very small segment of the population. In order to be eligible to apply for membership, you had to fulfill the following criteria. You had to be an unblemished adult Jewish male. Uh, why unblemished adult Jewish male? When this group rejected the cult in the temple and, and constituted themselves as a sort of substitute temple or substitute desert tabernacle, they lived literally with the notion that God and or his angels dwelled in their midst. And every full member of this sect adopted a priestly lifestyle, even if most members were not from priestly families. But if you became a full member of this sect, you adopted a priestly lifestyle um, and, and again, believe that, that God and or his angels dwelled in your midst. Um, and, and so in order to be eligible to apply for admission into the sect, uh, you had to fulfill the same criteria as there were for, for Jewish priests in the temple. And that was unblemished adult Jewish male, right? Those are the only ones who could serve as priests. I should mention, by the way, and this may not be known to all of your listeners, that Judaism uh, has a caste system where to serve as a priest, you actually have to be born into a priestly family. So the Kohen is the word for priest. So people who still have the name Kohen are descended from priestly families. But in this case, what happens is, is that if you, if you were admitted eventually as a full member, you, even if you didn't come from a priestly family, you adopted a priestly lifestyle. And that included things like wearing all linen all the time, which is, again, one of the things, the correspondences that we see um, between the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and our sources like Josephus. 
Um, and, and the idea was that uh, you then adopted this lifestyle and lived like that um, conceptually with, with God and his angels in your midst. Now, if you, if you applied, if you were an unblemished adult Jewish male who applied for admission, uh, you then had to undergo a long and rigorous period of initiation that lasted between two to three years. And during this sort of trial period, you were admitted, if you were admitted, you were admitted in stages, each stage kind of reflecting the attainment of a higher and higher level of Jewish ritual purity, because to be in the presence of the God of Israel, you had to be in a state of absolute ritual purity. Until if you were finally admitted as a full member, you were living your life like a priest serving in the temple. Um, and uh, along the way, if you were admitted at some point, you were then required to surrender your personal possessions to the sect because they practice the pooling of possessions. Now, uh, I, I, let, me, let me also add that um, our ancient sources, but the scrolls and, and our outside sources like Josephus, describe the admission procedures for, um, for men. Jewish men, but there, but there are no initiation procedures uh, that are described for women. So what, what is the status of women? Sometimes uh, there are scholars who have described Qumran as kind of like a monastic community. Uh, that's actually not correct. We know that members of this sect, full members, uh, were married and had families. And that's not surprising because ancient Jewish priests were not celibate. They were married and had families. But when ancient Jewish priests served in the temple, because they served in rotations, right? They, they kind of went for a couple of weeks and served and then would go back home. When they served in the temple, they would leave their families behind because of ritual purity concerns, not have any contact with them and then, and then go back. So um, apparently this is uh, part of what we see in the Qumran lifestyle that, or the lifestyle of the sect, that uh, full members were married, at least most of them were married and had families. Um, but there are periods when perhaps they, you know, they um, they left their families behind and and you know practice this very this higher level of ritual purity, um, and that means that there were women in the sect, but there's no there's no way for a woman apparently to voluntarily join. So women in the sect apparently either were born into the sect or or married into it, but they can't just like sign up the way that you know or apply to join a way, the way that a man would. Um, and so, so this then leads to the question of why anybody would, would want to live this kind of lifestyle. This is a very restrictive type, type of a lifestyle. Um, you had to observe a very high level of Jewish ritual purity, and that's something we can talk about separately. It's a whole other topic. People don't, most people today don't understand what it is. It's not, not you know, it's not something that uh, is um, uh, familiar to most modern Westerners. Um, but why would anybody choose to live like this, right? Uh, such a restrictive lifestyle, um, having to observe a high degree of ritual purity, being restricted in the kind of food and drink that you could consume, and so on. And the reason is because this was an apocalyptic sect that uh, believed that the end of days was imminent or apparently possibly even already underway. This, by the way, in this regard, is very similar to what we see with Jesus and his movement, this, this, this apocalyptic outlook. Um, of an imminent arrival or already the arrival of the end of days. This end of days scenario would be ushered in with the arrival of you know, one or more messiahs. Uh, in the case of the Qumran sect, they apparently anticipated the arrival of at least two messiahs, a royal messiah of David, so um, uh, a royal messiah descended from David, a, a messiah of Israel, and a priestly messiah descended from Aaron, possibly also a third prophetic messiah, that, by the way, is different from what we see with Jesus's movement, where, of course, Jesus combines all of those aspects in himself, right? His believers, his followers believe that he combined the royal, the priestly, the prophetic in himself, so you don't have separate messiahs. Um, you have the arrival of, of these messiahs. This ushers in this, this uh, scenario of an end of days where um, there's going to be a, a period of turmoil and war and upheaval and violence in the case of the Qumran sect. We have a scroll that describes this, the war scroll, where there's going to be a 40 year long war between the forces of good, the sons of light, and everybody else, the sons of darkness. One of the peculiarities of the Qumran sect is that they believed in um, complete predeterminism. Everything is predetermined by God, preordained by God. So the um, future events like this, this upcoming war were, and, and its outcome are all preordained by God. But it's not just that, your personal makeup, 
uh, how many parts of you are good, how many parts of you are evil, right? Your own, your what you do, all of that is is predetermined by God. So that means there's no human free will at all. That again is a big difference from what we see in Jesus and his movement. Um, and the end of this, you know, period of turmoil would would be, of course, at least in the eyes of the sect, the belief of the sect would be uh, the victory of the sons of light over the sons of darkness. And this would then usher in the final end of day scenario, which is the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. And the idea of God's kingdom on earth, which of course is a is an expectation that you find not just among Jews but also among Christians, is the idea that uh, God's kingdom will be established on earth and will create a utopia where there's there's no sickness, there's no disease, there's no starvation or hunger. You know, everything is great. Everybody is whole and perfect because they're in the presence of God. Because everything in the presence of God has to be whole and perfect. That's why only unblemished adult Jewish men could apply for admission. And when I say unblemished, what does that mean? It means that that they had to be whole and perfect. They could not have any physical or mental disabilities or handicaps. So only, only those kind of people could serve as priests in the Jerusalem temple. Only those kind of people were eligible for admission into the Qumran sect. And only those sorts of people would be represented in um, God's kingdom on earth, where again, there'd be no, no diseases, no sickness, no, no disability, nobody who's not perfect, right? Everything would be whole and perfect including, by the way, animals. Only perfect animals could be sacrificed to the God of Israel, right? There's a reason. So um, so that's that's a kind of a as short an answer as I can give to your very large question. What else do we know about the righteous teacher? Like, when did he live? What kind of enemies did he face, et cetera? Yeah, you know, uh, interestingly, um, some of our information about the teacher of righteousness comes from scrolls that uh, scholars now call pesharim. A pesher is an interpretation of or commentary on a biblical book. Uh, it's a it's a it's a genre that is distinctive to the Qumran sect, um, to the to this particular sect. Um, in that, uh, what they would do is they would take biblical passages, and and usually it's prophetic books, but not always. And they would take these these prophetic books and um, and they would they would take a passage from it, and then they would understand that passage in light of events in their own day, which, by the way, is something that some people still do today when they read the Bible. Uh, and and the the correct understanding of it, in the beliefs of this sect, the correct understanding of these passages was given to them by the teacher of righteousness. In other words, the teacher of righteousness was kind of an inspired teacher who revealed the truth of the meaning of these biblical passages to the members of this sect, right? So it's it's kind of like divine revelation. And from that, we learn, um, among other things, very, very interesting, uh, considering the time of year that we're at right now, um, we learn that in, from one particular uh, uh, episode in one of the scrolls, that the teacher of righteousness had become embroiled in a kind of a conflict with his main opponent, who is nicknamed the Wicked Priest. Uh, the Wicked Priest almost certainly was the current high priest in Jerusalem. And that his nickname, again, kind of tells us that. They don't tell us which high priest it was, but apparently the current high priest in Jerusalem, who was not a Zadokite, who was an opponent of the of the teacher of righteousness. And we learn that, that, that this uh, Wicked Priest apparently uh, uh, pursued the teacher of righteousness um, and and his followers um, on and and you know fought them um, on uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, uh, and that is something that's really interesting uh, because you know the Day of Atonement is one of the if not the most serious you know one of the most solemn and serious and important holidays in in the Jewish calendar. And why on earth would you have, you know, the teacher of righteousness and the and the wicked priest, right, fighting on that very holy day? And you know, we're now what day is it? Today is uh, Thursday, so this upcoming Monday is Yom Kippur, right? So we're right in that time of year right now. Uh, and Yom Kippur, by the day, was the one day a year when the high priest actually entered the Holy of Holies in the Jerusalem Temple. So what's he doing out fighting the teacher of righteousness on that day? And and. This is really revealing because uh, the reason is that that the teacher of righteousness and his followers, the members of this sect, observed a different calendar from the rest of the Jewish population. 
Uh, there's there are signs that this calendar may have been a, a, a solar calendar or a calendar that was more solar based than the calendar observed by the rest of the Jewish population. But the consequence of observing a different calendar means that the holidays that were observed by members of this sect fell on different days, different dates than the holidays observed by the rest of the Jewish population. Um, so, you know, the the wicked priest in Jerusalem for him that day would not have been Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, right? It was for the, the teacher of righteousness. And this would have been a big point of contention, by the way, between these different Jewish groups. What is the correct calendar? Because, I mean, on what day are you supposed to be observing these holidays that the God of Israel commands his people to observe, right? So that's a very serious thing. Um, and so it's probably not a coincidence that the, uh, that the wicked priest, the so-called wicked priest, actually attacked the teacher of righteousness and his followers on the day that they were observing uh, Yom Kippur. And what did what did the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us about the righteous teacher's death? It, it appears to be um, that he died in some kind of exile. Is that correct? Oh, well, yeah, those same scrolls do refer to the teacher being pursued to the house of his exile. Um, whatever that means, we don't know. And and let me clarify again and, and say that the scrolls that are referring to the teacher of righteousness and, you know, house of exile and all of that, we this is all before the settlement in Qumran was even established. Qumran didn't even exist yet at this point. So exactly where all of this is occurring we don't know we do have uh references in particularly in the damascus document to um to settlements of this you know of this community of this group early early on in their history in a place they call damascus <laughs> that's why it's called the damascus document and there's again a huge amount of debate among scholars about whether the damascus referred to in the damascus document where some of these people live is actually damascus in Syria, or is it a code name referring to some other site, right? It's not Qumran because Qumran didn't exist yet. But so it, exactly what happens, you know, at the end of the life of the teacher of righteousness. And by the way, there are scholars who have suggested that the that even the name teacher of righteousness, that nickname, refers not to a single individual, but to multiple individuals over the course of time who who earned that nickname. So we we just don't know the 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 um you know, the sectarian scrolls were, were not written to be history in the way that we would, you know, want to get historical information. So it, they're not always clear about the events that they might refer to. And, and usually if they do refer to them, it's for us, it would look like an incidental reference. And so you can interpret it in different ways. Are the manuscripts of the Bible um, that are found at, at the Dead Sea. Um, are they consistent, largely consistent with the with the Old Testament that we have today, or are there some major differences? Yeah, so let me just uh, uh, clarify before that and, and explain that what we have at Qumran are scrolls that, that were found in 11 caves surrounding the site, which scholars number caves 1 through 11. <laughs> And altogether, these 11 caves yielded fragments belonging to what were originally uh, approximately a thousand different scrolls, or at least a thousand different scrolls. Most of what we're talking about are small fragments surviving from what were originally complete scrolls. About a quarter of those scrolls are copies of books of the Hebrew Bible, or what some people would call the Old Testament. Uh, and, and in some cases, we have uh, we have multiple copies of books. In other words, in, in some cases, we have fragments surviving from multiple copies of books of the Hebrew Bible. For example, multiple copies of Deuteronomy, multiple copies of Isaiah, um, some of the Psalms, right? Um, in some cases, a uh, few fragments, in some cases, maybe only one or two fragments have survived from uh, representing a particular biblical book. And there's only one biblical book that's not represented by even a single fragment, and that's the book of Esther. And there is some 
debate among scholars about whether uh, the fact that there's no fragments of the Book of Esther, is that just um, a coincidence, you know, that they weren't preserved, they, the Esther was there, but it just didn't survive? Or was it never there to begin with? I think it was never there to begin with, but of course there's no way that we can know that for sure. Um, but aside from that, what we have then uh, among the Dead Sea Scrolls are these, these copies, sometimes in multiples, but usually fragmentary of different books of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. And they are by far the earliest copies of the Hebrew Bible that have ever been discovered. Until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the earliest copies of the Hebrew Bible that we had dated to the 9th and 10th centuries AD. So basically you're going into the Middle Ages at that point. Whereas most of the scrolls date to the second and first centuries BC, some of them a little earlier, some of them a little later. And that's important because they take us back much closer to the time when the Hebrew Bible was first uh, written down, edited and, and composed. And so we can then take the copies of the Hebrew Bible that we have from Qumran, those books, and compare them to the books of the Hebrew Bible that we have today and see whether any changes have been made over the course of time. Uh, and, and when I say compare, it's important to realize that what I'm talking about is comparing the original Hebrew of these texts and not the translations because translations vary. So what did the Hebrew Bible in the original Hebrew look like 2000 years ago compared with the Hebrew Bible that we have today and have any changes been made over the course of the centuries as it was copied and recopied and passed down to, to what we have today? And the answer is that there are changes and there are and there aren't. So the, the answer is kind of yes and no. Change has been made. The answer is yes and no. And the reason is as follows. So today, uh, today, everyone uses the same standard version of the text of the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew. So if you open up a copy of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament in Hebrew, anywhere in the world today, it will be the same exact same version, word for word, letter for letter. It will be identical. Because at some point, Judaism decided that there should be one standard authoritative version of the biblical text that everyone uses. And when that happened, the text that we use today, which is called the Masoretic text, was selected. What we have at Qumran is a period before that happened, which means that this is a period when different variant texts, different variants of the text of the Hebrew Bible circulated among the Jewish population. Some of these variants are proto-Masoretic, meaning sort of basically what comes, you know, what develops into the Masoretic text a little later but also other variant texts. Uh, and, and when I say variant texts, they don't usually vary hugely, but they do vary, you know, a sentence here, a sentence there for the most part, so they vary. Uh, and it wasn't until a later date that, that, you know, again, Judaism decided there should be only one standard version that everybody uses, and this particular version is selected. And what happens at that point then, and this is after the time of Qumran, right? So if we're talking about after the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD, so this is a later uh, process, but what happens then is that all of the variant texts that had circulated to that point ceased to be used and ceased to be copied and disappeared. And so one of the things that's so important about the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls is that we now have original versions and variant versions of the text of the Hebrew Bible that had never survived previously. And so obviously this is extremely important for biblical scholars. I would like to go back to um, the different ideas uh, regarding Qumran for a moment. Can you talk about the view uh, that some have that Qumran was a fort of some kind? <laughs> right. So the, the idea that Qumran was, Qumran was a fort or anything else for that matter, other than a sectarian settlement. So whether it's a, a villa or a manor house or a fort or a commercial entrepot or a pottery manufacturing center, all of those alternative theories are predicated on divorcing the scrolls from the site of Qumran. And as I try to emphasize, the scrolls are an integral part of the archeological remains of the site. So you cannot look at this corpus of, of literature, which is, you know, it's all Jewish religious works, some with these very distinctive sectarian, uh, you know, beliefs and practices and outlooks, um, and connect that corpus of literature with the people who lived at the site of Qumran and then interpret the site of Qumran as anything except a sectarian settlement. So that's that's one level. The second level is, is that if you look at, at Qumran, there's nothing that, that identifies it as a fort. Yes, it has a tower at the northern part of the site, which 
the inhabitants could use to protect, you know, fortify themselves if they had to in case of an attack and uh, keep a lookout for anybody approaching. But there's nothing else about the site that identifies it as a fort. There are plenty of uh, sites around the ancient world and even until today that may have a watchtower, but that doesn't make them a fort. Um, so Qumran really isn't, you know, it doesn't correspond with, with the kind of site that we would identify as a fort. It also has, by the way, and this is true of all the other alternative theories, it has a number of features that disqualify it from being anything else, whether it's a villa, manor house, fort, or whatever. For example, large numbers and large sizes of Jewish ritual baths, <laughs> which make no sense in a fort. It has a, a communal dining room, um, which again, very distinctive, or at least one, I think there are two communal dining rooms. It has no private houses or dwellings in it, which certainly is, is a little strange. Um, and it has these kind of animal bone deposits that I, I didn't talk about before, but are really distinctive and interesting in that in the, these were found in open air spaces around the outsides of the buildings. You have animal bones that belong to kosher species of animals, biblically permitted species of animals, so sheep, cow, goat, where clearly the animals had been slaughtered and butchered and the meat had been cut into chunks and boiled or roasted and the meat had been eaten off the bones and the bones were then laid on the ground, uh, mixed with ash and sometimes covered with potsherds, pieces of broken pottery or placed inside pots. And this is a phenomenon which really has no parallel in any of the other kinds of sites that are that are mentioned. And it's, it's quite peculiar to Qumran, but, but we do find parallels to this phenomenon at at ancient temples and sanctuaries, sites that were ancient temples and sanctuaries. And so I think there's actually really excellent, strong, pretty really incontrovertible archaeological evidence that uh, animal sacrifices were being offered by the people who uh, used Qumran as their, I think, community center is, is the excavator DeVoe put it like that, and he was right. Um, so that, that animal sacrifices were being offered there by members of this sect, uh, and that therefore the site functioned all or in part as really as a kind of desert tabernacle, right? A desert tabernacle in exile. So, so between you know between the the connection of the scrolls with the site, but also with the the archaeology of the site, the distinctive features there really doesn't fit the profile of a of a fortress or or any other um, one of the alternative interpretations that's been suggested. Were there any Dead Sea Scrolls that were found at Masada? Ooh, that's really an interesting question. So now that before I answer that question, um, let me let me problematize for you the term Dead Sea Scroll. So it's true. The title of my book is The Archaeology of Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And of course, these are popularly called the Dead Sea Scrolls ever since they've been discovered because they were discovered near Qumran, which is on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea. Um, so generally speaking, when we use the term Dead Sea Scrolls, we are referring to the corpus of literature that was found in the 11 caves around Qumran that are connected with the people who lived at Qumran, right? The site of Qumran. But other ancient scrolls have been found in caves, and not just in caves, in the vicinity of the Dead Sea. And so technically, you could call those Dead Sea Scrolls, even though they date to different periods from the time of Qumran, and have nothing to do with the site of Qumran or the people who lived at Qumran. They're, they belong to other groups of people, sometimes Jews, sometimes not, who you know lived in that area in various historical periods. Uh, and so for this reason, um, some scholars, many scholars, prefer not to use the term Dead Sea Scrolls to refer to the, the scrolls from the caves of Qumran, but they use different terms like uh, Qumran Library or the Qumran Scrolls or the Qumran Collection or whatever, showing that they're referring specifically to scrolls connected with the site of Qumran, right? Uh, and, and you find this confusion quite, uh, quite commonly uh, for example, the Israel Antiquities Authority recently, and even not so recently, has announced discoveries of new Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, which, by the way, are not actually scrolls connected to Qumran. They're ancient scrolls from other areas around the Dead Sea. So you see the confusion there. And so coming back to your question, first of all, in the larger sense of the term Dead Sea Scroll, because Masada is on the shore of the Dead Sea, you could, in fact, refer to any scrolls, any ancient scrolls found at Qumran as, quote unquote, Dead Sea Scrolls. 
But in your case, what you mean, and I know what you're referring to, are any scrolls that are connected with the Qumran community found at Qumran? That is, can we identify the presence of members of this sect, let's call them Essenes, at Masada, and specifically at the time of the first Jewish revolt against the Romans, which was between the year 66 and then the fall of Masada somewhere around 73 AD. So were there any members of this Qumran sect and, or you want to call them Essenes, at Masada during the time of the revolt? And is their presence reflected among ancient scrolls that were found on top of the mountain of Masada when Yadin excavated it in the middle of the 1960s? And the answer depends again on who you ask. So Yadin actually did find uh, uh, certain scrolls at Qumran, at Masada, um, which were the same types of scrolls that were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran, some very distinctive types of scrolls, for example, something called the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice. And uh, on that basis, he suggested that, uh, that members of the Qumran sect fled from Qumran when it was destroyed by the Romans, apparently in the year 68 AD, and fled south to Qumran and took refuge with the other Jews holding out on top of the mountain. Uh, and um, that, that suggestion is, I think, actually quite convincing, but, but not all scholars agree. And the reason is because the kinds of scrolls that Yadin found, including the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice, yes, are found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they're not necessarily sectarian compositions. Uh, they are types of works that could have circulated more widely among the Jewish population and not necessarily only among members of the Qumran sect. And so they in and of themselves do not necessarily reflect sectarian presence or Essene presence on top of Masada. But I actually think that the archeology span supports Yudin's view because in addition to those scrolls, we have at Qumran a very small number of these cylindrical jars with bowl-shaped lids of the same type that are found at Qumran in the caves with the scrolls, which are found in large numbers at Qumran in both the site of Qumran and in the surrounding caves, but pretty much for all intents and purposes are not found anywhere else. And so in my, to my mind, the presence of those very small number, but still the presence of those jars uh, on top of Masada um, does suggest presence of members of the Qumran sect uh, at at Masada at the time of the revolt, at the time of the siege. So, uh, but again, not all not all scholars agree about that. And in my closing question, what was in the Bar Kokhba caves in the Judean desert? Right. So the Bar Kokhba caves are actually exactly what I referred to before when I said that sometimes the term Dead Sea Scrolls is used more widely. Uh, and um, so, so if we go a little bit after the time of Qumran, so Qumran is destroyed during the time of the first Jewish revolt against the Romans, breaks out in the year 66 AD, Qumran's destroyed by the Romans apparently in 68, uh, Masada falls in 73, it's the last fortress uh, that the Jews held that, that fell to the Romans. And then what happens is about 60 years after the first revolt, a second Jewish revolt breaks out against the Romans in the year 132. And when that revolt broke out, um, during the course of the revolt, as you know, the Romans are subduing it, uh, Jews who lived at, in the village of Engedi, which is uh, south of uh, Qumran, but north of Masada, Jews who lived in that, in that village, which was a Jewish village, fled from their homes and took refuge in some of the caves in the nearby canyons, the nearby riverbeds. And one of those canyons is, uh, is Nachal Hever, uh, and in the early 1960s, archaeologists discovered and excavated, and by the way, this was the very same Israeli archaeologist, Yiga El Yadin, who excavated the top of Masada, uh, found and excavated a couple of caves in Nahal Hever that were, that were used as places of refuge by these Jewish families at the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt, this second revolt. And these Jewish families fled from Ein Gedi, from, fled from their houses, took their most uh, prized personal possessions with them, but ended up for, there's kind of a little story behind it, but eventually ended up being besieged by the Romans and, and ended up dying inside the caves. And what Yadin found when he excavated these caves, and particularly one of them, a very important cave, the Cave of Letters in Nachachever, found these possessions with the remains of, of these unfortunate Jewish villagers inside the caves. And what's important is that we have a, a, a whole repertoire of their personal possessions, including organic materials that aren't usually preserved, woven baskets, wooden bowls, uh, leather sandals, 
um, textiles from their clothing, but also uh, ancient documents that were preserved because of the dryness of the atmosphere, because these members of these families took their, their personal documents with them, private letters, even letters from the leader of the revolt, Bar Kokhba, um, very, very important. There's uh, one particular archive of documents that belong to a Jewish woman named Babatha, uh, which sheds very important light on, on you know, uh, the life of a woman in this period, right, this particular woman. Um, so yeah, so these are, are really, really important documents. Um, other documents from this period have been discovered in other caves along the shore of the, of the Dead Sea. Um, and some of those I alluded to before are more recent finds, in fact, including more recent finds announced by the Israel Antiquities Authority. Well, thank you for joining me today, Professor Magnus. Thank you for having me back, Jacob. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.